So welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining. I um, would like to ask you if you're not speaking, please mute your microphones. I would also I'd like to ask you that if you have any questions, please type them into the chat window and we will um, read them out and answer them at the end of the presentation. Also the presentation um, and the, the recording of it will be posted in the app after the event and it will be available to, um, to view for those delegates that weren't able to um, attend the workshop for six months after the event. So welcome everybody again, and please enjoy the workshop. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, I'll be starting us off today. So my name is Neem Cranavelt. My grandmother is the late Nessie Watts, and my mother is Sharon Watts Van Bolsen, and my father is the late Art Van Bolsen. So I'm Hoopachesset. Um, Hoopachesset is one of the 15 nations uh, sprinkled along the west coast of Vancouver Island. And we include our, our family in Washington state, uh, the Macaw, when we think of our new channel family. Um, I'm super excited to be here with all of you today. And today um, I'm coming to you from Stanamis territory. And um, it is a grayish type of day, but still beautiful. And um, it's an honor and a privilege to be sharing this story with you. So um, we're going to be talking about um, some work that was done a lot on Vancouver Island. Um, we called this the COVID collaboration circles. And uh, the reason why we use that term is it really was collaborative in nature. We also wanted to avoid the word research because then that would mean delaying the project six to eight months until we jump through every bureaucratic process that there is when you use the word research. So um, it, it felt good to use collaboration for a number of reasons. And the reason why I'm spending some time on this word and the terms that we used is because words matter. So we use collaboration for a number of reasons, um, including part of the practice of reciprocity. And often research is extracted, where you go in, you interview people, and you take that information away, and you go and you use it for some other purpose. Um, the spirit and intent of the collaboration circles was really to ensure that there was a benefit um, on so many levels uh, for the individual participating within the circle, um, for their family members who would also gain from getting information and providing information into the circle. Um, so individuals, families, communities, and nations. And we really actually kind of spelled it out, what's in it for me on all those levels. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about how we got started and uh, that should set Becky up really well to do the presentation. And then again, we have Pam and Graham joining us that can be of support. And then we also have the beautiful Noreen um, from Cleoquiet First Nation, um, who was, was actually one of the primary leaders within the community to make sure that everyone's needs were taken care of. So um, my hope is at the, as a result of being involved in this session that um, you have a very strong sense of how we started out, what we wanted to achieve, uh, what we were able to achieve, and how that's benefiting the community. And then we wanted to save Noreen for last to answer any questions and also just to um, really kind of tell the story of how things unfolded in her community and the way folks were taken care of. Um, so just a little bit about um, the, the project itself. Um, we had community champions in the nations that chose to participate and they provided information um, to the viu team and i won't get into the nuts and bolts of that you will see how that unfolded but i just wanted to let you know that we did work with community champions and um, again in the spirit of reciprocity it wasn't that they were just giving information they also received a plan out of that process and this feels like a really good point to, to pause and to turn things over to you, Becky, and to tell a little bit more about um, the whole process. Yeah, great. Thank you, Neen. Um, my name is Becky Thiessen. I'm the Planning Project Coordinator at MABRI, which stands for the Mount Arrowsmith Biosphere Region Research Institute, uh, which is a research entity at Vancouver Island University. And um, yeah, I was able to facilitate and kind of um, do some, some lead work on this report, which I will share with you shortly. I am located currently in the Sunemo territory and very happy to, to be here. So thank you. I will just um, start by sharing my screen and then I'll walk you through the work that we, we did last year. 
things. So uh, once again, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as I mentioned, this report that I'm about to share with you, the stories and so on, we started collecting this a year ago. And so um, it's kind of shocking to think that this is this is already that the whole year has passed and we're still in this pandemic. But um, uh, as Neen mentioned, this this was a, was a collaboration and we did call ourselves a collaboration circle. So um, a huge thank you to NAMA, the National Aboriginal Lands Managers Association, who supported the work that we did. And of course, to Neen and the Vancouver Island Community led pilot projects and to the Vancouver Island um, Masters of Community Planning students who also um, did a lot of work in um, listening to stories and compiling data and so on. So, so thank you very much for, for everyone. We were adapting, um, like as we were learning to work in COVID, we were also listening and hearing from First Nations um, and their experiences and their responses to the pandemic, um, specifically in the Vancouver Island region. So as I mentioned, this report was completed, um, well, started in May, completed in 2020, already feels dated, but we hope to add, add to the, this experience in this report by continuing to listen. If we don't learn from the lessons of the past, the history and the devastation of past pandemics will only repeat themselves. We included this quote as a call to action. Looking at the past, learning from actions and experiences will only help plan better for the future and what may come of it. We know that with this pandemic, there are so many variables and so much unknown. So in order to plan, to move forward, to not repeat the past, we listen and we use that knowledge. This quote was taken from an op-ed piece in the Georgia Strait by Dr. Judith Sawyers, uh, president of the New Chalna Tribal Nation, and Marilyn Slept, chief counselor of Hailsook First Nation. I'm gonna start you off with one of the stories that we heard. Namgis and Tlaibquit First Nation, working together and lending a hand. Throughout the report, you'll notice, once you have access to it, I'm, we're happy to share and on the app, we'll also um, post it so that people can have access to it, read it and so on, and, and get it into a bit more depth, but there were stories scattered throughout it. And as I mentioned, I wanted to share this with you. Many of you know that the Namgis First Nation experienced an outbreak in the community early in the pandemic. An elder passed away and 30 people tested positive. The 30 people who tested positive did recover. And this has contributed to their successful and thorough pre-emergency planning and preparedness. Before COVID-19 entered the community, Namgis First Nation had created a comprehensive emergency plan. And because of this effective planning and action, the virus was contained. The community had asked themselves these what if questions before the initial breakout. And so we were able to, quick, to be quick and effective in their responses. On May 9th, 2020, three members from the Tlokuit First Nation arrived on a fishing boat with a massive gift of fresh ceremonial fish to be distributed to the community members. The Namgis First Nation members came to the community dock to greet the, greet the boat. A welcome song and dance were performed for the Tlokuit fishermen. Around two tons of fish were dropped off, which was then processed into freezer bags by the Namgis members and distributed amongst 190 households. So I will share you, with you some additional details of the report. Um, in this report, we'll explain our methods, how we collected the data and the, how we gathered the information. Um, as I mentioned, we've included feature stories throughout it that give us a broader and deeper and more comprehensive understanding of the experience of people. We also included a timeline throughout it. Um, and this represented global actions that were occurring alongside the realities of the pandemic close to home. We looked at various reviews, um, or plans and reviews, comprehensive community plans, emergency plans, what existed prior to the pandemic. And then throughout the report, we share with you responses and challenges. And later on in our presentation, I will share with you that as well. I will finish this presentation um, with what we call future preparation. We created um, the care model and the prep framework. And so I'll also go into detail exactly what that means. As Dr. Sawyer and Marilyn Slett stressed, this is a critical need to apply lessons learned from the past 
But even the most recent past can teach us many things about planning and preparing for the future. We recognize the realities of this pandemic and that our knowledge is constantly changing. Our responses are being adapted as we understand human actions and different approaches and protocols. We consider this a working report and open to adaptation as we navigate these times. This report captures a brief time in this very complicated era and we hope to continue this work so that we can always strive to adapt and do better than before to learn from our lessons. We, gave, we gathered our data in a number of ways. We familiarized ourselves through webinars, governmental pandemic response reports, emergency planning literature, and existing comprehensive community plans, emergency plans, and or pandemic plans from 21st Nations in the region. We reached out and had personal interviews with community members, as well as use public available data such as news articles, Facebook, websites, community websites. We were looking to find what responses by communities worked, what did not work, and how could communities plan better for the future. Community responses, three types of community responses. Our results reflected a broad range of community responses. We were able to identify three main types of responses actioned by First Nations communities. These were administrative or band office responses to protect staff members and residents, community support initiatives designed to support community members who may not be able to access resources in the same way as before the start of the pandemic, and community protection initiatives designed to protect the community from the spread of COVID-19 virus within the community. So first off, our findings, administrative responses. Administrative responses were aimed at keeping the staff at First Nations administrative offices safe while also maintaining some semblance of business continuity. Of the 43 nations, we were able to view 38 of those that enacted some form of administrative response. The most popular response were temporary office closure, closures, shifting administrative duties to an, to an at-home or remote, remote format, and to reduce the service provided to community members to essential services only. Every community was unique in their response, and many included other official and collaborative actions such as declaring a local state of emergency and opening emergency operation centers, EOCs as they're also known, and collaborating with other local organizations such as neighboring municipalities of the local RCMP or local tribal councils. Community support initiatives. Community support initiatives were aimed at providing much needed access to resources that had suddenly become less available during the pandemic such as access to food or transportation. We found that 34 of the 43 nations we were able to examine responses for community support initiatives for members. The most popular initiative found was communities updating their members about COVID-19 information through newsletters, websites, flyers, Facebook, including resources from the FNHA, the BC government and Health Canada. This was often information as many of us have become so familiar with safe social distancing, hand washing, hand and surface sanitation. Other popular initiatives included grocery and hamper deliveries to members, distribution of food, fish, or other additional stores, cash distributions and financial supports, as well as access to medical care or prescriptions over the phone rather than in person. So community protection initiatives. This was aimed at protecting the community from the spread of the pandemic. 38 of the 43 nations with responses implemented strategies to protect the community. The single most popular initiative was encouragement of protocols such as hand washing, surface sanitizing, social distancing, staying home and wearing masks, as well as self-isolating if any symptoms were beginning to appear. Other popular initiatives, including closing road, roads and borders to the public, um, except for emergency services, the closure of public buildings, such as libraries, community centers, longhouses, less official ways of deterring out of community visitors, such as postage signage at community entrances and encouraging the postponement or cancellation 
of formal and informal gatherings and ceremonies to reduce the spread. The fact that First Nations communities on Vancouver Island are so diverse means that different communities are vulnerable to the effects of the disease in different ways. We found that the unique challenges faced by these communities included transportation challenges, such as restricted access to services for communities that are already limited by the physical environment, such as requiring a boat or a float plane, administrative challenges, such as staff handling both pandemic-related and non-pandemic-related duties in the same amount of time with the same resource and staff working under burnt out conditions, funding challenges, such as a lack of information regarding is funding and time being wasted on, on applications the communities were ineligible for, border security challenges, such as not having the resources to enforce border closures, housing challenges, such as individual dealings with homelessness during the pandemic, and the challenge of multifamily households isolating in place, physical and healthcare challenges, such as not having the capacity to provide overnight admittance to the community health center, and family safety, mental health, and substance abuse challenges that were already present but were exacerbated during the pressures of the global pandemic, such as alcohol-related domestic violence and the opioid crisis. Future preparations. So from our conversations with community representatives, we found there to be seven key areas that should be addressed in future pandemic responses. Um, for further detail and more in depth, you can take a look at the report to get a, a, a deeper understanding, but essentially I'll go through some of our findings. We found that this is what communities need for good future preparation, a good working emergency plan that connects to a pandemic plan, a structural policy that guides pandemic responses, clear format, easy to understand. Funding and staff report. For good planning, there must be secure funding that allows for training and certification of staff and community members, effective communication, improving network strategies with new and existing organizations, consider how information is distributed for best responsors for all community members on and off reserve. Multi methods of communication is essential to reach as many people as possible to ensure public health. The community is well stocked with PPE and accessibility to health centers for testing and treatment. Work with the community to develop a list of supplies needed and a plan for distribution. Member health, access to food, debrief and check in with each other, support to those suffering with addictions, improve housing conditions. The continual adjustment to reliable information as it is needed. This is the this is the encouraged responsibility of individuals thinking in terms of public health and access to technology and internet critical during an outbreak to remain educated and in communication so out of all of this this information and these findings we came up with what we called the care model so this is a unique model for planning to be used in collaboration with the prep Framework and the PREP framework, PREP stands for Epidemic Response and Emergency Planning, which I'll explain shortly. So the CARE model, create, activate, respond, and evaluate, um, is clearly cyclical. As the pandemic rises and falls, there is time to act, react, to act, react, and evaluate as it changes and as we learn better from our responses. So in that first quadrant, um, could be pre-pandemic or a low contagious period. So this is the time to create the plan, to adapt it, to practice and ask those what if questions that Namke's First Nation asked. And then when we're in pandemic alert, this is time to set that plan in, in motion to activate it. High pandemic period, this is time to respond and act on the plan to react to the realities of the situation. And then we come around the circle again to evaluate what went wrong, what we needed to um, review, and how we need to alter the plan. And once again, we go back, we go back to the top of the quadrant and work through. So using this cyclical model, um, we developed this framework that communities um, could use, but it's it's a template and absolutely adaptable to the unique situations of, of, of any community. So in that first quadrant, create that low pandemic or, or I mean low contagious period or pre-pandemic. We divided it up into four categories. So 
considering this is a public health uh, situation, we are all involved in taking uh, responsible action. So what, what can families do? And so we've come up with some sort of list that obviously can be added onto you, but consider, um, you know, who is the most vulnerable in your family? Who needs to be taken care of? Um, how, will, how will that be provided? Um, what are some of the community support actions that can be considered pre-pandemic? Um, you know, this is when you build your volunteer team, you know, and consider programs needed support, um, health, mental health, and so on. How will you protect your community? And what are the actions and that administrative and the band will take? You know, start to create that, that, that prep team with detailed roles and responsibilities. And then activate. So once again, we've divided this into categories to be to be altered as it's most suited for the community and these are just some of our suggestions that we've put in here you know um what can families do if schools are closed how will children be cared for at home um, come up with a plan looking at community support um provide the community with with information as best and in many ways as possible looking at community protection actions, you know, um, post signage of community closure and so on. And then looking at the, the role of the, the band and the administration, you know, when is it to time, this is the time to declare the local, the local state of emergency. And so then we move on to the third quadrant, respond, and once again, divide it up into um, the actions and the um, of the community members of the families and so on and, and once again in that report you can, you can go and look into more detail and then as as we evaluate go back to your community you go back to your families and discuss how you were impacted and what you can change and, and survey and listen and, and and constantly move through that cycle as we learn um you know from the past and and, and work work towards the future so uh in closing thinking of next steps we would love to continue this this collaboration and continue collecting stories as we move through um you know the various waves and and uh, the vaccination rollout and the new variances and how this is affecting various communities and and we do hope to pilot the prep framework and the care model to see um, how is it effective and and how it can help and support communities as they continue to adapt and create their own their own plans um for for future planning so thank you very much and i will pass um, this back to you, Neen. Thank you. And just before we move on to Noreen, because I think it's so important to have um, the story told through the community lens, and um, certainly Cleoquid has uh, done a beautiful job of taking care of folks and can be viewed as a promising practice. So um, part of the reason, you know, we asked Noreen to, to step forward and share her story is, um, personally for me, I was able to witness firsthand how the rollout kind of took place in Cleoquit. Uh, we happened to be there filming uh, on the second round of vac vaccinations, I believe. Mm. And, um, you know, I just, I notice a lot because we are in community and, and filming and uh, doing a lot of digital storytelling work. Um, I'm really able to, to see the full spectrum of where communities land on their response to COVID and, um, you know, I really look to Cleopiate as, as a shining star. A lot of communities around vaccination time were very um, upset and angry because folks on reserve were able to access um, the vaccines and other supports, whereas people off reserve weren't able to um, have access to that same benefit just because of their geographical location. And I, you know, I really look to Cleopiate and, and the work that they did um, in, in letting people know First of all, we see you, we hear you, we understand what you're going through. And I think they did a lot of work up front explaining how the vaccination would roll out. So they didn't necessarily have as many as, um, you know, those angry folks um, that weren't getting access to services or supports because they had been super clear, timely with their communication um, and transparent with, with all of their decisions. So. Um, with that little introduction and, and why um, I thought Cleo Quit would be such an amazing um, story or community to feature their story. Um, I'm just gonna turn things over to you, Noreen, and um, I'm not sure if there's any questions yet, but I'm certainly excited to hear um, from your perspective, particularly some of the things that you think you did or your nation did really well in terms of taking care of folks and where you think others could benefit the most.
Thank you, Neen. Um, and thank you for the presentation, Becky. Um, my name is Noreen, as, as Neen said, Noreen Messer, and um, I work for Tla Oakley at First Nation. Um, I am of Irish and Scottish ancestry. Um, we basically started working with Tla Oakley uh, soon after I graduated from university, back a long time ago. I won't say how long ago. <laughs> um, but I, um, yeah, I really have a lot of respect for the nation and um, in particular how everybody does come together in a crisis. Um, so I think COVID-19 um, and the pandemic has really um, been another example of that, how, you know, our leadership, our staff, our community members all really came together um, with the understanding of um and goal of protecting the most vulnerable members um you know our elders are 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 um, you know our historians and language teachers and um are very valued by the community so everybody had that goal to to keep the elders safe to keep people with compromised immune systems safe and um to keep yeah to keep everybody safe so it was uh I think a really a whole community effort. Um, we had a great leader and Elmer Frank, um, a Tolokwe community member, um, was appointed as the our EOC, our Emergency Operations Center chair for the pandemic, and he led a, a EOC committee who kind of made decisions throughout the pandemic. I think we we're lucky in that we already had a bit of a team together, an emergency prep team prior to COVID coming in, and we did have an all hazards emergency plan. So it didn't speak specifically to, to COVID, but we did have some policies and procedures around activating an emergency center and also around pandemic, although we had to find, you know, fine tune our policy to be COVID specific um with the covid regulations and um you know i think Tula Oakley, it's a fairly unique um community a unique nation in that um we're situated um one of our communities in the pacific rim national park um adjacent to tofino and then our other community opitsit is across the water from tofino so boat access only so we're rural and remote communities but also um, our neighbors in Tofino uh, as a, and the park are international tourist destinations. So it gave us um, some unique risks, I think, for communities with like a uh, low level of resources and a very low resource hospital. So we were very motivated to keep everybody safe and we activated um, community health checks at the entrances to our communities fairly early on to keep everybody safe and we really established a really good communication system we did regular updates on zoom um, with our community members um, our committee met on zoom and we just kind of really tried to be creative and and adaptable to the situation we were dealing with um, and really have good communication with our community and create really clear um, covid policies and protocols we created um, a whole set of like HR policies um, that would be with that were enacted throughout um, COVID. Um, encourage like our our term staff and part time staff were given sick days that they didn't have before, just to make sure that if people did feel sick, they could safely stay home and not have to worry about their finances. So I think there were a lot of things like that we did to kind of prepare and. And just encourage, like, I think that was one of the main things. Elmer is a great leader and a great cheerleader and just really encouraged everybody, um, all the members to just remember that why we're doing what we're doing, that we're doing it to keep each other safe, to keep our most vulnerable members safe. And it became like a real community effort. And I think people, you know, really did a good job we did have a couple of members who got COVID in community and were able to very quickly isolate them and make sure they were set up with everything they needed and that they had people to go grocery shopping or get whatever they needed and and did contact tracing before VHA was there to do it. So we we're pretty mobilized. 
I think early on, we did uh, a lot of shopping for community members. We were just talking before we started about back in the early days when all the toilet paper and, um, you know, essential food items kind of flew off the shelves and in our isolated community that was really quick with the tourists coming through and taking toilet paper on their way. So we uh, did bulk shopping and, and just really tried to take care of the community in a good way. <coughs> so I don't know if anyone has any questions. I don't want to just ramble on too much. <laughs> I actually just typed one in there. Um, and, and my question was, what are you most proud of in terms of Cleopit's response to the pandemic? Um, I guess two things. I'm really proud of like how everybody worked together as a team. Um, we had on our, like on our EOC committee, we had staff and community members and leadership from our council and our hereditary chiefs and everybody just worked and pulled together to do what was best for the community. So I think I'm really proud of that. Um, and then I'm also just proud of the way, um, we came together to try to to do the things we knew were important you know we did have quite a few losses during the pandemic um only one covid related loss but we did lose a lot of members um and we you know we got creative about doing um community healing circles on zoom and um meeting you know usually if someone passes away everybody in the community comes and gathers around the family and brings them food and you know, we weren't able to do those things that are so important. So we ended up being creative and having a lot of Zoom gatherings, community gatherings on Zoom and having cultural nights and um, got creative doing like community meetings. We're in the middle of developing our comprehensive community plan. So we started doing all our, you know, Wednesday night meetings on Zoom for the CCP. And so I think that that was, I'm really proud of that too, that we just kind of were creative and adaptable and like made the most of it and still tried to keep those heart connections alive for everybody so we didn't all go too crazy being isolated. Thanks and I have one more question. Um, I'm just wondering if you could describe for the group, um, obviously not in, in great detail, but um, just describe a little bit about the ceremony that um, how how people and process were taken care of when the vaccines arrived, um, like who mm. was there to greet folks and what did that look like? Because to me, hearing the story when I was there to, to do the digital storytelling, and even right now, I have goosebumps just um, yeah. thinking about just what makes Cleoquit so cool and strong is your, your teachings and your culture. So um, mm. I'll leave it there and ask you to describe that process. Well, the vaccines coming was very exciting, obviously, for everybody. Um, there, you know, were some, some of the issues of, like, you know, our off-reserve population um, members weren't able to get vaccinated at first, so that was really hard. Um, it was, like, put us in a real... Um, I guess just an inner conflict. I'm trying to think of the right word, but uh, because usually, of course, we would first um, immunize our elders and our people who have health issues and stuff, no matter where they lived, you know, so it was kind of a weird thing to, to not be able to do that. But we, at the same time, is advocating really heavily for, for people living away. <laughs> we, we just tried to celebrate as much as possible the vaccines coming and we, um, we had a lot of ceremony, especially the first day. Um, the a lot of elders and our hereditary chiefs and some of our singers came out and and welcomed the vaccination team. The nurses from from NTC and FNHA came in and and it was quite a celebration. They were welcomed really warmly and there was a lot of ceremony and celebration and prayer to prepare them in a good way for the, the work they were going to be doing, taking care of our community. And at the same time, we just tried to really get members excited about it. And, and we took pictures of our elders, you know, getting vaccinated and share that online. And it was really, yeah, it was a really a big celebration. You know, there are some people who are apprehensive 
Um, and we didn't, you know, there was no judgment to people about what they wanted to do or not do. We just tried to ed educate everybody and, and to, to try to be as positive as possible about the opportunity to, to be safer. And it was, it was quite, quite exciting for everybody. Unfortunately, we, I think in the end, we ended up with our first round of vaccinations doing seven clinics um, total, which was pretty crazy. So by the end, you know, we were all pretty tired um, of setting, having to set up everything, the health team, Naomi Seacher, who leads our community and human services and, and the team there did a fabulous job, you know, informing everybody it was all very organized and, and it, and yeah, it was a big, it was really a big celebration. The last, the last session for sure. And we're all looking forward to round two at this point, hopefully next week, it's supposed to be, I think. Thanks, Noreen. Um, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, but um, just open the floor uh, to the team and, and the participants on the call um, for comments or questions. Yeah, if people don't feel comfortable or don't know how to, to type in the chat, just feel free to speak out too. Noreen, I'm, I'm curious of the changes like in your community and especially with kind of your, your, you know, the folks who are operating in the emergency operations center, like some of the, the learnings as they've like from, you know, those very initial days when so many of us were so worried and weren't quite sure of our roles or our responsibilities in this, like how it's like as to now, you know, more than a year later, is that, is it become kind of, I don't know if easier is the right word but kind of maybe people have more clear roles or um, responsibilities in terms of how to continue to navigate through this like I'm just curious how that's changed over this year as we're learning new things um I don't know I think people are just kind of solid in their in their um, resolve to keep the community safe um so mm -hmm. it's been you know at first it was I think it was really uncomfortable for everybody on the EOC to be kind of making rules for everybody, especially mm -hmm. like things mm -hmm. like curfews and um, gates at the community. It's all kind of feels really big brotherish, you know? And, um, yeah. but I think like that comfort grew with just that understanding of how hard we're fighting to keep everybody safe and just the reasons behind it. And, and I think people just came to welcome the, protection for the community more and more so it was um I think yeah everybody just became more solid in that and now you know we're starting to apprehensively like reduce the restrictions you know now that I think we've got 80 percent of the community immunized we still obviously our mm -hmm. kids aren't immunized yet so that's hard um but we are starting to have a little more like we just um lost a a highly revered elder and we're able to have some graveside outside service for people for the first time in the year so so that felt good you know to to start being able to have and for the first time now we we had the communities closed so um our SOS and Tyastanis community and Opitsa community couldn't visit each other or people couldn't come to town from town to visit mm. But now if people have their immunizations, they can come visit their family and in their, as long as they're still sticking to their bubbles, right? We're still mm -hmm. keeping to our small bubbles, but you know, if somebody wants to go visit their grandma, they haven't been able to see for a year and they're, you know, lonely that we'll be able, able to open it up a little bit more now. So that's, that's feeling really good, you know, mm -hmm. to kind of be able to have some meetings. We've always been a bit stricter than BC. And now um, we're kind of relaxing a little bit. So that feels good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any questions from the group? I have heard the chat and I don't see any hands up. I will say, I, I know that Becky mentioned that uh, she'll post the prep report that she spoke to on the app. Um, mm -hmm. But as well, if anybody's not on the app and they would like us to email it directly to them, if they want to put their email 
in the chat and ask for it. Um, I just tried sending it to myself. It's a pretty big file and I wanted to see if it worked and it did. So, um, and my university has a pretty small uh, allowable um, email allowance. So um, I, we're happy to send it on to anybody directly if they would like to receive it that way. Great, thanks. Okay. I guess I'll ask uh, Noreen the question, in, in, in town, I'm in Nanaimo uh, right now, and one of the changes we've seen is, is uh, blocking streets uh, to cars or creating more outdoor gathering spaces for people, or um, it hasn't really happened, but more people are, are you know, using trail parks and trails. So have you noticed, have you made any changes like that, like creating more outdoor spaces or having meetings in outside spaces? Um, and are those things you think you might keep doing? Because it's actually worked really well. I think we've done a bit more programming for youth outdoors, um, that kind of thing, which I think will continue. It's always an ongoing goal that we have. I guess, you know, our location being right beside Pacific Rim National Park, like people are pretty outdoorsy already. And um, if anything, we've had, at first we had like, almost a bigger influx of people who were seeking out that kind of, you know, tourists that wanted to be walking on the beaches and stuff. So, um, you know, there's been, I guess, that, that effort of, of the nation to keep, to kind of just keep the tourists away from the, from the communities so that we're still able to have that space, to have out time, outdoor space. So, you know, Ty Stannis and Essa Worcester at the end of Long Beach. Um, so we've kind of had some youth guardians that have been out um, just kind of encouraging people to, to not come to the end of the beach there. And so families could still have barbecues outside and fires and, and stuff. So I think, yeah, I think a lot of people have started walking too. There's been like some walking challenges, um, you know, people trying to like count their steps and um see how many kilometers they can walk a day and that kind of thing so i think that you know there's been that you know and there's definitely been some some people that have come together to do that together to go on their daily walks and and that kind of thing so so that's been nice to see Um, I'm you. just going to make a, a comment as well um and noreen you might want to speak to this afterwards but um, one of the things that i noticed and this happened before vaccines it was you know early to mid uh pandemic and that was the the homelessness crisis um wow i was shocked when i went to some of the areas within your territory that i've visited before mm -hmm. and the shape that they were in i'm making a lot of assumptions so please don't take this as fact um I know when they clean up the homeless camps though, because I've seen enough, I know that everybody gets these totes. So some of them, you know, private areas within Cleoquit territory were, you know, in, in my words, you know, felt like they were invaded and it was, and, it, and there were all these totes. So my assumption is that when they broke up these camps, they put people on a bus and just shipped them to Tofino, which was, um, you know, in, in my view, my words, you know, fairly disrespectful given the very limited health resources you have, like you have one ventilator in your hospital. Um, so I just wanted to say that there's a lot of things that we can control and many things that we can't control. Um, I don't mm -hmm. think that, you know, Clayoquid had any saying in all of these um, camps relocating in your territory, but I did see that you took a very strong response in terms of your guardian program and I don't know if you want to speak to that or if others might have questions related to that. Well yeah it's definitely a big social issue um, the homeless crisis in Canada and British Columbia on the island <clears throat> is impacting all communities I think and um, we do have a very nice climate um, in Tofino and there there's actually a lot of employment there for people too but there's just not housing. So um, it is a crisis. There were a lot of people with, um, you know, a lot of barriers, social barriers, addiction, mental health issues. And it became uh, a big concern for our guardians, for our members in a lot of our territories, because we want to take care of 
of people too and and we're not really able to do that out there if there's a crisis of course we're going to respond to it which then would put our members in danger <coughs> so it it what it has been a big concern and continues to be a big concern there's still a lot of people living in the bush in our territories and vans and in tents and and um and then you know it is it is um there have been you know ambulances and fire trucks and police responses that have had to go out into the bush and and it is um it is uh concern for the safety of of our own members but also the safety of the homeless folks too like in a really isolated places so you know we, we always have that um desire to make sure people are taken care of so you want to we want to address it in a good way and really um we just need more support for the folks out there to, to find different um situations for them to be in that are healthier and safer so yeah it has been a big challenge though for sure and um it's something like yeah i hope all levels of government are going to start doing something about Thanks. And it's just actually that one of the reasons why I, I brought it up is that, you know, your nation is doing all the right things, but we, you're still faced with systemic failure, mm -hmm. you know, outside of your control. Yeah, definitely. And still have to advocate, you know, at the same time as advocating for our members for the services they need, you know, we have to deal with those kind of things, which is definitely an extra burden during the, the pandemic for sure, you know. All right, anyone else have questions? There's a, a beautiful comment in here from Megan. I don't know if you've seen it yet, Noreen. Oh, awesome. Thanks, Megan. I'll be sure to pass that on to our fishermen and leadership who arranged that. I think it was, I think it was the same for for our members involved too. It was, I think it was uh uplifting to actually be able to do something to offer assistance. So yeah, just in case anyone's shy out there, there's no such thing as a stupid question. And this you've got a pretty um, <laughs> informed panel that um, would be happy to answer any questions if folks have any. Can I just ask a question, Noreen? Um, mm -hmm. uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I, I, I've been looking after my daughter and listening in the, the conversation, so I didn't get everything. But did you say you had about, it was 80% of the population has been vaccinated, roughly, something like that? Yeah, that's correct, that have our, the first round of vaccinations. And, and what did you find was the most effective way of like um, engaging and, and uh, with, 80% of the population to get them on board with the vaccination because I know that's been a challenge. Well, we really tried to, um, we had like been distributing some food boxes during the pandemic because as I mentioned, our grocery stores got pretty low on supplies. So we kind of had a system where we were, um, would call people out in streets, like in address groups to come and get their food, you know, food boxes just to keep everybody safe so we didn't have too many people at the center. So we kind of had that system in place and then just continued to use it for the vaccines. So at first we just kind of called people into the center to get their vaccines by, first we did the elders and people with compromised immune systems and then kind of opened it up to the adults in the community by street address kind of at first and then, um, and then as we did the the following rounds of vaccines, we reached out to people who we had, we knew it was a lot of work to keep track of all the vaccines and who had been vaccinated and who hadn't. And, and we definitely had people, a surprising number of people who just are afraid of needles, you know, like you don't really think about that always, but it's like a lot of people have a lot of anxiety around needles. So we had, a, you know, some people who, would come came a few times to the door and just didn't have the courage that day to come in and do it so 
you know, just encouraging people to, to face their fears and remember why we're all doing it, you know, and, and also just accepting people who, who weren't ready to do it yet. A lot of people the first couple times weren't ready, but just providing education and encouraging them to come back when they had the opportunity, we kept letting them know the opportunity was there and, and also doing a lot of education on, on zoom about, about the vaccines we have. Um, Christine Curley is a, our community health nurse and she's very trusted by the community. So she was able to kind of talk a lot about the science and the, and how the vaccines were tested and different things like that. So I think it helped put people's mind at ease. Thank you. Yeah, and I guess it would be um, remiss if we didn't uh, touch on the fact that there, there is a significant amount of mistrust towards um, the medical profession in, in some ways and into research in some ways. Um, my mom, who is an elder, you know, when this first came out, we, we talked about it. She, um, she survived TB twice. So once in the residential schools, um, you know, she, she faced a, a pandemic. Um, and then also um, we had an outbreak in Port Alberni about 10 or 15 years ago. So when I talked to her about it, like, you know, what are your fears and what do you think about this or that? She said, well, first of all, I have my traditional medicine. So she already had a plan in place and she accessed her medicine and, and was prepared for that. Um, and actually worked with Becky and another group on just how her personal response to that. Um, and then with the, with the vaccines, with a lot of the elders I spoke with, um, they were very concerned and did not want to get vaccinated. And really, um, you know, in, especially in Cleoquit situation, um, I, I think what made it a win or, you know, what, what was super helpful is you engaged early and you engaged often and you met people where they were at. You communicated in a way that made sense to them. And you came at all angles. It could be one-on-one, -on -one, it could be a phone conversation, it could be a Facebook post, it could be your regular updates, it could be a piece of paper within your food box. Like you really kind of came at that information from all angles. Um, anyways, it felt important for me just to, to point out and acknowledge that there is so much mistrust and, and how that would in, impact um, a vaccination program. And I thought I had one other thought on that. Oh, I know, um, for me and my own kind of research um, and, and some of my closest friends and colleagues, we figured, you know, whatever they gave to the doctors in the early run, like for a vaccine, if, if we were getting the same, then we were probably safe because the doctors have already had it. And if there was any adverse reactions, we would have heard about it on a broader scale. And, uh, you know, personally, I have some phys physicians within my circle and I, but well, they didn't drop dead in the first 24 hours. I think we're, I think this could be safe. But again, just wanted to mention, just it's another layer of com complexity that people may not consider through a First Nations lens. And it's important to, to think of things that way. Um, my mom had all her teeth pulled out at 14 uh, because they thought it was a good idea in the residential school. Um, the, her residential school she attended, um, they also did just some nasty research and testing that, um, was horrible. And so they've experienced um, trauma in terms of interacting within the system. And uh, that certainly impacted their initial and overall response to the pandemic. Yeah, I think there is a lot of mistrust and fear about being guinea pigs, you know, like, why are they vaccinating us first? And, you know, those kind of things definitely came up. Um, but I think, um, I think we're also just um, to add to um, Stephen, what you asked, like we, we did get the Moderna vaccine too, which I have to say is probably the least controversial of the vaccines, it seems. So that probably played a factor in us being able to get so many people vaccinated as well. So I just wanted to say that because I think it probably is a, definitely a factor. It's not all about our promotion, but I think people felt a bit safer about the Moderna than if we would have been getting AstraZeneca or one of the more, you know, fear ones with a lot of fear, fear around them. So I think that was definitely lucky. And we also had our leadership. Um, I was just thinking while Neen was talking, like our chief counselor, Moses Martin, you know, he's a, uh, uh, really an elder, a wise elder. And, you know, 
our hereditary chiefs and um, some of our, yeah, other elders, you know, were happily getting their shots first and, and sharing it on Facebook and stuff. So I think that also helped people get excited about it. Right. Thanks for that, um, Noreen. And we're just kind of sunsetting on our time. So just, um, you know, also maybe offer a last call, but also just extend um, our collective gratitude from our team um, to everybody who's been participating in this workshop. And um, in our language, thank you so much for taking an interest in this. And, and um, my hope is that you can use this information to help advance the work that you do in whatever way that you can. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. Thank you for hearing our story. Yeah. And as a reminder, the presentation and the recording is also going to be posted on the app. So if you want to access it or direct anyone to the, um, the stories, please follow the app. And I will also post, um, as Gren mentioned, the, the full report that has a collection of all the, these stories and, and the prep and the care model. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, everybody. Have a great, great night, and I hope to see you all back um, at the conference tomorrow. Bye-bye.